Now, having discussed uh, these situations where uh, the soil would respond to the environment. So, another example of uh, how soil is going to behave or respond to the environment is the current news uh, which you should check out on net. Uh, the oil spill and oil spillage is causing uh, different types of problems for the uh, flora and fauna which is surviving on the lakes and this is a story which is very pertinent to everywhere in the world including you know our own uh, campus where we have Pawai Lake and uh, of course this is the situation which has come because of the oil spills. So, subsequently I will be talking about how the fluid fluid interaction takes place and uh, this is how the soil gets influenced or the geomaterials get influenced. And another example which is very contemporary is uh, what we are hearing from the news is uh, a substantial amount of uh, water from the Fukushima power plant radioactive power plant is being discharged into the ocean. So, this is also a very good example of how pore fluid characteristics will change the properties of the soils. So, all these things I am going to discuss subsequently and these two particular cases fall under the category of soil liquid interaction where the soil could be sediments or the uh, beach sand or uh, how they are going to interact, what type of uh, problems they are going to pose to the environment and so on. So, switching over to the interaction what is interaction which we have been emphasizing and I think this is the crux of the entire discussion which I am going to have with you. We are talking about the interaction issues, how the interaction occurs alright. So, I will play the video again, this animation again to notice the waste is being discharged and there is a well alright and this well is being used for withdrawing the water from the ground, ground water. So, there is a depletion of water table which is occurring and then this is the waste shown in the red color. When you are dumping any waste on the surface or near the surface of the ground, it passes through the point of disposal until the great depths alright. So, what is happening? The first interaction is the waste species are going to interact with the soil mass which is above the water table. Now, we classify this as unsaturated soil or variably saturated soils which you have already done in uh, conventional geomechanics. You remember the situation where there is a layerified deposit and there is a water table and then you are supposed to find out the effective stresses at different depths all along. And this is where we have introduced the concept of capillary rise and uh, state of saturation of the soil mass. So, this zone which is above the water table could be 100 percent unsaturated dry or could be partially saturated or could be variably saturated. The interaction of the soil which is in this zone with the waste is going to be entirely different than the one which is below the water table. So, this type of a problem becomes a dynamic problem that means, as a function of time the more and more utilization of the ground water which is being done in the form of the pumping, the water table keeps on going down alright. The unsaturated zone of the soil keeps on expanding the soil here is saturated by virtue of being submerged and this is also going to interact with the waste components. So, we have talked about two types of interactions right now. Contaminants interacting with the soils which are not fully saturated, contaminants interacting with the soils which are fully saturated. Now, this is an aquifer which I have shown over here. Because of disposal, the chances are that the contaminants might also percolate into the aquifers or the water bodies which are inside the ground. What is going to happen? Now, this water I am going to suck out for consuming 
for domestic purpose, industrial purpose or whatever. So truly speaking this becomes a pathway, pathway of contaminants which have been disposed after interaction with the soil, saturated soil becoming a part of the aquifers from where I am drawing the water and hence this becomes a complete circuit. The second situation could be this whole concentration or contamination might also get deposited at the bedrock. Now this depends upon the type of contaminant which you are using or which you are dealing with and the type of the porous media which you are dealing with, clear. Now what I have done is I have also shown here the ground water flow. So ground water flow is in the lateral direction and I hope you realize first we discussed about the interaction of contaminants with the soil mass partially saturated, fully saturated, fractured rock mass and now we are superimposing the impact of movement of water table. And then fourth case study which I have brought in over here is the entire contamination might settle down over here, particularly if its density happens to be higher than the density of the fluids. So this is the scenario which uh, tells you what type of interaction is taking place. Another side of the story is whatever activity or whatever concentration or whatever type of contaminants you are going to dispose over here, they might also become a part of the aqueous system because of the flow and then the roots of the plant may uptake these species and then this becomes a part of the food cycle or food chain. Overall these type of situations are being faced uh, by every industry, by the municipalities in the present scenario. The canister which I have shown here could also represent a landfill, there could be a landfill over here, correct? And by any eventuality it is possible that the basal liners which you have provided in engineered system might rupture and this may happen. And think of the situation when there were no engineered landfills, these were the dump yards. So there we do not have any basal liner, basal liner is the one which is provided at the base of the landfill facility so that no contamination goes outside, alright. So I hope you are realizing now the complexities are increasing. There could be a situation which I discuss in the class where the low level radio waste all right, might be disposed in the trenches which are approximately 10 to 10, 20 meters deep. So this might also represent a sort of a trench or a vault. Vaults are the systems in which the toxic waste is disposed of by doing proper engineering. All right. I think we discussed about this that what type of materials are required which would act as a barrier for migration of contaminant into the geoenvironment. So you can create several cases out of it depending upon what type of study you are doing. Now this can also be treated as a point source of leakage, point source of contamination. Suppose if this unit corresponds to a buried pipeline, all right, sewage pipeline. And it so happened that either because of differential settlements or because of the activity of the soil this cracks. A simple geotechnical engineering problem of providing a sewage disposal system, how it gets converted into environmental geotechnical point of view as an environmental geotechnics problem. So all these activity which is inside, I use the word activity to cover up all the attributes of the waste, okay. So, when the leakage happens, the similar situations is going to occur. This could be oil pipeline, it could be sewage system, it could be a sludge, it could be the effluents coming out of the industry, it could be the discharges which are happening from the industry itself in an open space. So what happens? The dimensionality of the problem keeps on changing. Here we are considering this as a point source. If this is within a certain area, this might become a two dimensional case. It might also become a three dimensional case. So what we will do is to keep things very simple, first of all we will concentrate mostly on the mechanisms 
and these mechanisms are going to be in one dimensional domain clear though in the previous discussion we have talked about all the parameters change as a function of x y z and t so truly speaking it is a four dimensional problem but for the sake of simplicity we will simply say all these parameters are changing as a function of depth over a period of time very simple case first to begin with so this is the interaction scenario which is what we are trying to master which is what we are trying to model i'm sure by looking at this picture you can also realize that how geo microbiosphere comes in the picture the basic intention of showing you the root system is this is where most of the microbial you know bacterial activity will harp on and this i had discussed in the previous discussion that this becomes a very interesting case of roots soil bacteria microbe environment interface and you will find in the recent journals there are many people who are doing uh, simulation modeling mathematical modeling of these type of situations a good example would be suppose if i wanted to stabilize the slopes by using vegetation all right bio inspired stabilization of slopes so one question would be at what spacing i should be growing what type of a vegetation the roots will be penetrating too much into the ground they will produce enough suction and they will hold the material together and hence the erosion will not occur so many of you who are just trying to think of the possibilities you know how this interaction can be dealt with i'm sure you are realizing that it becomes extremely complicated and difficult in the real scenario okay now at very minute level if you go into the discussion the first question comes in mind is whatever chemical species biological species radioactive species all right which are being disposed over here how are they going to interact with the material itself how to quantify this because so far we have been only talking about this we have not quantified it we have not defined a mathematical term which will define the interaction between this and this this and this this and this why this settles down what will happen if the ground water table comes in plays a very important role so from this point onwards the conceptual visualization of the situation starts so in our subject the most important thing is create a conceptual model i'm sure most of you are aware of dispersion process advection process you have already studied this in your undergraduate is it not in environmental sciences also you have studied the same thing dispersion of contaminants which are thrown out of the chimneys and stacks that dispersion was in the air now what i have done i have just changed the whole situation by 180 degree so this suppose if this was the stack of the chimney rather than emitting it in the atmosphere what's happening all the emissions are happening in the subsurface in the geomaterials that is the new concept i hope you are realizing soils are hyperactive many a times you have studied mineralogically active materials how they are going to interact with this contaminant phase there could be passive materials also sands non carbonaceous sands pure quartz inert materials they will not interact with the contaminant at all so here also i have created several situations so i hope you are realizing these situations can be created based upon what is that you are trying to study so as a consultant suppose if i appoint appoint you and this whole thing represent an industry clear so the question is whatever the affluence will be produced from the industry how they should be taken care of and this type of situation should not happen this type of situation can be averted what measures you are going to take another challenge are you realizing so that no under no circumstances under no eventuality leakage ever should occur in the subsurface hope you are realizing the domain of 
uh, what we are going to discuss. In modern day environmental geomechanics, I can change the whole context, what our uh, Yogendra is working on, what uh, Sini is working on. This is nothing but injection process, is this correct? So, rather than talking about the injection in the liquid phase, all those who are interested in working on CCUS, carbon capture, utilization and storage, because this is a very hot topic, what the intention would be? The intention would be to purge CO2, all right, in the deep saline aquifers. You are not going to take a chance to purge the CO2 in the soil mass, there is no point in doing that. Okay. So, another context I have created to the interaction problem. Now, what is happening? How the gases are going to interact with a porous media which contains pore solutions of different types and how gases are going to interact with the pore solution in the porous media at a certain pressure temperature. This is what the concept of environmental factors would be. All right. There could be another situation where Kamran is working, where I want to use carbon capture utilization. I do not want to go much deeper. I will take CO2 which is coming from the stacks and I will purge it into the material which is stacked on the surface, which is coming out of the industry and I will like to neutralize this material if it happens to be hyperactive. So, these are the interaction problems which I am talking about. This is the interaction of geomaterial with environment, environment which has been created by human beings, all right. The environment which has become so complicated that has become very difficult now to clean it up. I hope this part is clear. If this picture is clear, now we will start moving into understanding what are the components and then very soon we will be delving into how to define this interaction mathematically. But I hope you understand any mathematical equations will be having many parameters. The next question would come, even if you have defined the problem mathematically, how are you going to get the parameters which are going to control this interaction? Are you realizing the whole chain of questions which are being asked? And then comes the answer, let us do experiments either in the laboratory or pilot experiments in the field or real life demonstrations in the field and then only we will be getting the parameters. So, it is a big story. You like to add something? For the interaction problem, like all of us are being like dealing with the interaction problem like fluid fluid interaction, uh, soil mass fluid interaction and so as professor was saying that now math mathematical equations will be coming into the picture and which will be governed by certain parameters and how to def how to define that parameters and how to find out the that parameters. So, that will be a challenge as an experimentalist. So, that will be an interesting. So, a simple example is all your uh, permeation tests which you have done, hydraulic conductivity tests, correct? I hope you remember the way you have done falling head tests and constant head test. K coefficient was not known. So, you did several experiments to get the K value, delta H upon delta X dimension of the sample are known, area of cross section is known, length is known, you could compute k value by knowing the discharge. Now, what trick I will do is, I will add some salt solution, salt into this water. How I have changed the context? And I want to ask you now, how permeability of this system has changed? Clear? So, that means, depending upon the concentration of the solute and its type, what is we are going to add and how it is going to permeate, k parameter will change. One thing which you ignored is how this water is going to interact with the soil mass, but now the water which was percolating or let us use the word percolant is having chemical activity, clear? 
and soils are active materials. How the interface between the soil and these contaminants which are present in the percolant is going to get developed and what is an impact of this is to be studied. Hope you are realized now I have done the coupling. Coupling is hydraulic phenomena permeation. I have coupled it with the chemical action. Percolant having concentration of salts contaminants. I can further add on trivialities to this. I will say what Fakra is working on. She is trying to pass a fluid through a rock mass, trying to extract the heat, geothermal extraction of heat, correct? What is happening here? The water or the gas or the fluid comes in contact with the rock mass at elevated temperature, heat exchange takes place, okay? And we are taking out this fluid which is at elevated temperature to convert it into some mechanical electrical devices. This is a sort of a thermal coupling. That means, if you redo that test of falling head constant head test where the water was percolating, I added the chemicals into it and I heated the water. And now I want to see how concentration is changing within the geomaterial along its length, lateral direction when it is at elevated temperature. So, that means, now your domain of the soil mass would be having a temperature profile, a concentration profile and a hydraulic gradient profile. Are you realizing the difference between situation which can be created very easily? Now, suppose under this T H M C, if I ask you work out the hydraulic conductivity of the material or the system, your advection laws are not going to be valid anymore. Why? There the fluid was passive, soil mass also you considered as passive, but now both of them are active. Hope you are realizing. How it is linked with this situation? The waste which is being disposed is having some concentration of chemicals, radionuclides, temperature, clear? Half life. There are chances when we are dealing with the sewage ponds, and suppose sewage leaks out, biological activity, microbial activity, viral activity. Hope this gives you a very clear idea about what is happening and where we are heading. Any questions? Anybody would like to add something? Uh, yes, uh, to add on to it, like uh, as Professor was saying that uh, it just depends how you are seeing into it as the interaction problem. Like initially we started with that, uh, if we are adding a waste and then how the material is going to behave and how it is going to interact. Same way, like all of us are dealing with the interaction problem only. So, in case of my case, then I am injecting a fluid and then seeing how the reservoir will behave when thermal, hydraulic and mechanical and chemical stresses are acting on it and uh, how actually the reservoir itself is changing. Because uh, as Professor was saying, to have a permeability, you are considering that the reservoir is not changing. But here, when the chemical action happens, some of at some places it will be getting precipitated and at some places it will be getting Clogging. dissoluted. Clogging. Yes. Yeah. Or dissolution, yes. what he is talking about, mm. yes. How at that time your uh, processes and all which you had considered that it was a passive, so those processes will not take place, how that you will be studying, that is where it comes into the interaction and the environmental geotechnology. So, that means concept. the precipitation of a salt in the pores is going to decrease its effective porosity, clear? Now, you considered everything in the conventional geomechanics that we will be talking about that today everything is constant, pore system remains constant, truly thing does not remain constant. He is talking about dissolution, all right and so on. Yes, anyone else? I want to add in this, uh, like uh, in my case also, since uh, uh, professor said that uh, advection uh, equation cannot be valid, since of course, if the geomaterial is uh, also changing, so the, it will not work. And also one thing apart from the interaction, how much uh, uh, am amount uh, the contaminant concentration is changing 
and with the depth that has to be quantified with different uh, at the different different depth the parameter will change as the professor said that three parameter like the concentration temperature and the hydraulic gradient so we have to also consider with the depth how how these three parameter are changing so we have to consider all the parameters okay. anything so in this situations the nature of mechanical loading also will be different so uh, normally we study me mechanical loading means from external sources apart from uh, normal uh, external sources uh, the external stresses can be due to gases fluids or al also it it is not necessarily that in it, it it will alter the pore pressures or something it might ask, alter the total stress acting in the systems. So that is also one of the possibility. Say disintegration. If material is not, uh, you know, um, competent enough to withstand these chemical activities or the thermal activities, what's going to happen? There will be degradation. There will be a decay of the material. So your unit weights are going to change, stresses may also change. What he is talking about in particular is the pore pressure alterations. So, when pore pressures are getting changed, the whole geomechanics of the problem gets changed. Okay, anything else? I just want to add uh, to the interaction problems that we are facing in uh, natural systems is that they will depend obviously upon the species that which are interacting in the porous media. So, for example, if um, like I am working on a problem which is reactive gas transport through porous media and currently I am dealing with <coughs> the natural carbon sequestration in some uh, mine tailings. So what I am observing is that there is very importance of how the unsaturated flow is taking place because they are going, because uh, these things are going to govern the mechanisms of interaction, how uh, the uh, carbon dioxide or some other gas is going to react with the minerals. So there is like the unsaturated flow, then we have the energy uh, balance equations, also then solute transport and the gas diffusion, as well as coupled with the geochemical equations or the reactions that are going to take place. So if we want to model these things, then we have to get, uh, like we have, we have to create a coupled effect of all these interactions, little, little interactions, so that uh, they, they, are, they are resulting in a particular product, say the carbonates. So how these mechanisms are going to change, that will actually uh, influence the interaction problem. I hope you are realizing what is the domain of our activities. Any questions, any thoughts from this side? Yes, please use the mic. Uh, sir, generally uh, before choosing this landfill area, we, uh, we find a low lying, a low lying area generally we choose. So, sir, before uh, choosing that area, do we do any test uh, of ground work for no, no any groundwater table depth or do we do any test of that uh, depth of groundwater table or generally low lying area we choose and uh, we'll use that for the landfill site? Very good. I thought that this thought, if it would have prevailed 100 years back, these problems would not have happened. Why I am saying this? Because 100 years back, nobody bothered about any of these discussions. They never bothered about what type of soil it is, what is the area, how the rehabilitation will occur, where the groundwater is, whether the soil has sufficient bearing capacity or not. Nobody bothered. These were all dump yards. Clear? So this is a legacy which we are carrying with us and the effects we are seeing. Clear? All sorts of health problems. Check it on net, you will find hundreds of problems associated with the landfill caused you know, diseases in the flora, fauna and all. But yes, if you are doing engineered landfills, engineered disposal sites, you have to take care of all these things. And that is where the profession steps in. You have to monitor groundwater flow, soil conditions, all right, its bearing capacity because there is going to be a system which is going to stand there. You have to cut off all sorts of eventualities so that any type of leakage occurs. All this has to be done, which forms a good practice for EIA, Environmental Impact Analysis. So as we move on, your question will get answered automatically. Yes, but I think your question is good. And uh, my only first reaction was that this should have been done 100 years back to bail out of this problem. Any other question?
Yes, anything? Hmm. Uh, on interaction with bedrock, how it will affect bedrock? Uh, I hope you are realizing everything gets deposited over here because of the density. So, imagine, imagine if this keeps on growing up and up and up and there is no water table. I will be talking about this situation. So, what is happening? Everything whatever you have disposed because of very dense phase liquid keeps on piling up over here. So, the landfill which you are seeing every day when you drive on the roads. What is happening? Inside there is self a landfill of dense phase liquid getting generated provided there is no water table movement. And suppose if you superimpose on this heap the effect of water table what is going to happen? This whole thing will also start acting as a secondary source of contaminant. That means it will flow in this direction and it will contaminate the entire downstream side. So, you have created another two states of the interactions. Just imagine you know whatever human activities are doing are into what type of damage they are going to do the environment. Another good example of this would be suppose this is my industrial premises where I have freedom to do whatever I want to do, but I do not have that freedom beneath the subsurface and you are operating from here. And what is happening? You cannot stop water table to move and change. So, all this activity is going into your premises and this becomes a case of a legal discussions. That when I want to draw water for my industrial activity, I am getting all sorts of contaminated water which is because of him. Look at this, how the profession has changed immediately. I am sure you asked this question out of your ignorance but your ignorance has led to this point and which is what is happening. So, when you select sites you have to be very careful who are your neighbors. Number two environmental impact analysis I will not allow you as a government to do any industrial activity over here if there is a water body nearby. My first question would be how are you going to cut off the interaction between the waste over here and the water body. Convince me first. So, this is what the de detailed project report would be for any project where you are talking about environmental impact analysis. Is this okay? All right. So, moving on to the scenarios which we have discussed so far. When we talk about pollution process, soil pollution interaction, pollution is a very general word one of the attributes of the pollution is contaminant. When the limit of this contaminant increases and exceeds the permissible limit, this becomes a critical issue. So, we talk about air pollution, water pollution, land pollution. Uh, air pollution, some of the examples are smoke odor, incineration, when you are burning some waste, incineration takes place and then air gets polluted. Industrial gases which are being released in the environment radiations which are coming from different types of activities, sewage, odor, this should be vehicle exhaust, uh, pesticide sprays, dust of different types. We were discussing about the marble dust, you remember in the first lecture somebody was here from who was that, uh, we were talking about the marble dust and marble dust creates lot of problems for uh, the soil mass, soil becomes barren because of the clogging of the pores and so on. The water pollution you know the water gets polluted, it will contaminate the surface and ground water. Uh, this is coming out of the chemical waste, oil pollution, I have cited one example, silt in water, typical dams where the siltation is taking place, nutrients in the runoff, when the runoff occurs most of the nutrients get washed out from the soil mass and so on. Because of the water pollution, because if the pH of the water changes the cohesion between the particles would change all right and they may get dissoluted also many times. So, the nutrients cannot remain adhered on the soil particles and they may get you know washed away. Then land pollution, open dumps which we were talking about the landfills, uh, chemical waste, power plant waste, fly ash mostly, uh, septic tanks, the sewage sludge, chemicals in soil and the food, over fertilization of the crop 
that, that can also cause the land pollution. Soil erosion may occur because of chemical activities as we discussed here, agriculture manure, I think uh, uh, Goli has done a lot of work on organic soils, uh, before that Dr. Arif in my lab where we are showing the impact of exceedingly high concentration of organic matter in the soil, what is going to happen because this organic matter over a period of time keeps on decaying and when the decay happens a lot of acids are formed, humic acids correct. What type, what acids will do? They will dissolve all your cementation between the particles of the soil and hence this is how the soil erosion might occur. So, people think that agriculture and manuring is going to help truly speaking this may also impact the stability of the soil mass apart from high concentrations of chemicals which are a constituent of the fertilizers and the manure. So, these are the possible uh, you know pathways, how the engineering behavior is going to get affected because of all these possibilities. So, here I have grouped them in uh, changes, what changes the soil mass will undergo. Accelerated weathering, it is a good example you are seeing you know most of the cities, the buildings particularly in the coastal areas they do not look so nice as compared to the buildings in the arid region. Why? What is the reason? Because here you have a lot of chlorides, sulphates, industrial towns where you have a lot of you know active gases in the atmosphere and they have a tendency to penetrate through the concrete and causing weathering, corrosion and uh, you know exfoliation and all those things. So, these are the examples of buildings, bridges, pavements. I have been a part of several bridges collapse in this in the country and uh, I do not know whether you will be getting my reports or not, but some of them are on the uh, published by the newspapers where I have established that. Uh, main cause of failures of buildings and bridges is attributed to the industrialization in certain part of the country. Then if you talk about the water body, uh, water pollution uh, you know then workability, durability of the concrete might change because of the presence of the contaminants. Uh, the soil water system itself might change. So, you are studying uh, geomechanics, conventional geotechnical engineering where they talk about liquid limit, plastic limit, shrinkage limit which is nothing but soil water interaction clear. So, that concentration the moment concentration of the fluid changes, temperature changes this type of interfaces are going to be different. Hydraulic conductivity changes, hydraulic structures might get affected which we have discussed today. Land pollution we have discussed about change in hydraulic thermal conductivities this I will be introducing slightly later thermal conductivities. The compaction properties might change when the uh, contamination levels are very high, settlement response might change, overall soil stability change, uh, seepage characteristics might change, corrosion might change. So, this is a very elementary matrix what we have discussed is much much beyond you know the domain of what I have listed over here. So, because the list is endless. Now, let us talk about some of the basic concepts. And from this point onwards, I am trying to emphasize that why uh, everybody is trying to consider environmental uh, geomechanics, you know, and its importance. So, first let us talk about the basic concept. The basic concepts are that most of the geotechnical engineering projects occur in nature. And this is the very peculiar situation in our profession. Even if you consider a building, most of the surface area of the building is covered, it is not exposed to the environment except for the outer surface all right. But in case of geotechnical structures let us say dams, embankments what happens? Most of the surface area is exposed to the environment. You are making dams and embankments to store water to create a cutoff between the tidal action and the land. So, that means most of the time geotechnical engineering projects remain in touch with the continuous environmental interaction even if you look at the base you know seepage. So, you can cut off from the environment it is really a part of the interaction between soil mass and the environment. 
The second concept which we have learned so far is soil is much more sensitive and susceptible to environment than any other construction material. We talked about this because the way the soil was formed, it was the weathering process of the rocks. And when it is a young material, it is very sensitive to and very susceptible to environmental attacks, fine. So, we have to introduce long term phenomena, which was not done earlier. Similarly, when we are talking about soil is very sensitive, we have not really given a serious thoughts to how the interaction changes because of the environmental stresses. So, that is what I have written here. When you talk about only mechanical loading, we have been limited only up to crushing of the particles and rearrangement of the grains. But truly speaking what is happening? This crushing might also result into heat generation. A beautiful example is you should read the papers where they have talked about you know when landslides occur, what happens at the scar surface. So, imagine a certain portion of the soil mass is getting detached from the parent body. Imagine the amount of friction which gets developed on the surface between the parent body and the material which is sliding down. Clear? So, there are several studies which have been done where heat associated with the interaction has also been considered now in analysis of failures. So, you, you check out in the net several studies are being done in this way. So, all your models related to uh, landslides analysis, slope instability analysis are now being fine tuned by considering the effect of the heat which gets generated at the interface. The second issue is when we talk about moisture, all right, how moisture variation takes place in the soil mass because of the environmental changes. In conventional geomechanics, we always talk about the moisture linked with the compactibility, clear, compressibility, shear strength, these are the three characteristics, permeability also. So, if you do not saturate the whole sample and if you do the hydraulic conductivity test, what is going to happen? It is not correct. So, why did you soak the sample for 72 hours to make it fully saturated? Okay. And then you are talking about hydraulic conductivity through the saturated soil mass. How hydraulic conductivity will be obtained from unsaturated state of the soil is a very different subject altogether. And if you are very eager, you should check out the uh, papers published by my earlier students, particularly Dr. Hanumant Rao with IIT Bhuvneshwar right now. He has done most of the work in how moisture changes occur and how to create a situation where you can talk about the hydraulic conductivity of unsaturated soils. So, we have done different types of treatments to create a state of the material where we have expelled out water from the soil mass rather than allowing water to enter into it. I hope you are realizing. Similarly, the pollution intrusion, what I was talking about the ingress of the pollution, how it is going to alter the whole. So, truly speaking the matrix is basically limited to these two things. Uh, everything should be long term and we should add more components of the factors which have not been considered so far. Okay. So, with this in view, what we will do is we will try to synthesize now the flaws which are in conventional geomechanics and why there is a need to upgrade this, uh, this subject, you know, classical geomechanics from where the environmental geomechanics has evolved. So, first thing is that specific gravity and Atterberg limits are supposed to be constant. You must be realizing that we have been repeatedly talking about alteration of the state of the material. When the alteration of the state of the material occurs, specific gravity cannot remain constant. All its fundamental properties, the way it has interacted with the environment in the form of water would also change. Are you realizing? Most of your empirical relationships you must have realized they are dependent upon the specific gravity and the liquid limit. CC value for an example, LL minus 10 multiplied by some parameter this gives you the CC value. 
Now, what's the, what type of situation I am creating? Neither the specific gravity is constant, not the Atterberg limits are constant. Why? We have discussed so much because we have ignored so many things. Void ratios and porosities cannot remain constant. She was talking about, he was talking about, he has given you some situations about mineralization taking place in the pores, pores getting choked or pores getting opened up because of dissolution of the porous media. Clear? So, neither porosity is constant nor the void ratios are constant. I hope you will agree with these things. Another thing is that we have talked about so far the gravity water in conventional geomechanics. Truly speaking, there is a need of the hour when we should consider as environmental water also. What is environmental water? The one which is adhering on the surface, the one which has a tendency to penetrate through the mineral surface. Okay? So, there is a sort of a contaminant migration which is taking place from outside the surface of the mineral into it and we call this as you know chemisorption because of the chemical activity which we have not really considered so far. So, anyway when you talk about the water in the soil mass is mainly uh, gravity water, we need to consider environmental water and we have to also consider the solid and gaseous phases as well because the in the water you might be having this as a contamination because we are talking about several situations where the sludges might be percolating. Flow through a soil mass is only due to hydrostatic potential advection, the simple advection which we have talked about, but truly speaking this is not correct because I have created so many situations by this time where I have shown you that it is not only the advection which is causing the mass transfer flux transfer to occur through a porous media. Clear? So, this is where we have to realize that how water in the soil mass will respond to different energy fields and this is where we start talking about the effect of elevated temperature alright. Low temperatures also I think you must have realized from my discussion that we also talk about above freezing points, but low temperatures. Beautiful example was frozen soils, gas hydrates, permafrost, all right. Electrical, most of the sensing device which we are going to talk about would be working on principle of electrical flux. So, if I want to sense what is the moisture content, what is the density of the soil, people are using sensors these days, okay. That means, they are trying to understand how electrical energy is going to migrate from the sensor to the soil mass or the geomaterial and then get the signatures in such a manner and interpret them in such a manner that I can correlate the hydraulic conductivity with all these parameters, moisture content with these parameters and so on. Magnetic properties, most of the soils are constituents of minerals and minerals have magnetic characteristics. Okay. So, how magnetic field can be utilized? There are sensors which work on the principle of magnetic field. Of course, electromagnetic things are coupled with each other. I can pass current, I can create magnetic field. I can create magnetic field and I can measure the current also. So, this itself is a coupled phenomena and the chemical effects which we have discussed quite a lot. So, truly speaking the flux the way it has to be defined is, is the coefficient of energy conductivity multiplied by the energy gradient. This concept has to be brought in now. How would you quantify this? Q is proportional to I, Darcy's law, clear? That means, V is proportional to I, that was for advection process. That means, any flux the way it is interacting with a porous media is a function of its coefficient hydraulic conductivity multiplied by the cause and the cause is nothing but gradient delta H by L. So, delta H by L becomes hydraulic gradient and this becomes K and this we have defined as seepage velocity or discharge velocity correct. What is going to happen if I change this equation to 
take into account thermal effects, electromagnetic effects and chemical effects. Why? Because soil mass is getting exposed to all of them. This we will discuss. There is another interesting question which comes to mind is, I hope you understand what are constitutive models. Constitutive models are relationships between stress and strains. So, sigma is a function of epsilon clear and we define this as a elastic modulus in case of soils. Elastic modulus could be drained, undrained, you have studied all those things in your tractual testing. Drained, undrained itself was a case associated with the type of loading which the material was undergoing and the type of drainage conditions which were applied to this material. Drain where the water goes out very quickly, permeability is very high, undrained. Either you are closing the drainage path or the material is so impervious that the drainage cannot occur. So, we have talked about drained, undrained situations, clear? Now, what we have to do is we have to refine the constitutive models by keeping into account all of these things. How many years it will take to come out with the answers? Many of you are asking the question that where are the case studies, where are the <laughs> real life problems? Please do not forget we are still into lower kg, upper kg class of the subject. How many tests have to be done? How many replications have to be done? How many types of situations have to be studied on different types of geomaterials? So, efforts have started, lot of people are working in this direction. But imagine the last point is very important, we are all engineers, ultimately the question is how I am going to make a system which is worthy of withstanding all the environmental stresses, nothing else, correct? Very good. So, ultimately I want to work with stress strain relationship. Is this answer so easy to reply? How stress strain relationship is changing as a function of time? When all these issues are a question mark, people are trying to work on this. Degradation, upgradation, interaction, how are they changing the constitutive models? That is the reason unfortunately or fortunately not many softwares have been developed so far in the realm of environmental geotechnology. Why? Because people have realized that this is a very different you know game. And now you will witness how whatever I have been speaking about is going to get you know substantiated. Wait for some more time, have, have patience. I told you, uh, you, your intention should not be to become an expert of the subject. What is that you are trying to do? You are just trying to realize what is the spread of the subject and what are the issues which are still under a big question mark and where we can contribute if time permits. Nothing more than that. So, please do not be under stress at all. Just try to imagine uh, a sort of a new type of a discussion which is going on in the realm of science and technology. So, here I have put this major assumptions under scanner. The scanner means what needs to be changed. Constant seepage velocity is not correct. We have discussed so much, all right, material itself is getting altered. Coupled flow processes we have not really taken into account, how moisture, heat flow. Uh, takes place, how fines are getting migrated from the soil matrix, you know cavitation occurs, void formation occurs, gully formation occurs because of the excessive exit gradients from the soil mass. We have also to discuss about the saturated versus unsaturated state of the material, alright. There are many people who are working on dedicated unsaturated soil mechanics. It is a very, very fascinating area where some of you should really contribute to because there are not many dedicated research groups and facilities available in India at least, uh, but yes there are some good laboratories abroad and where you should really try to develop both abroad as well as in India depending upon your uh, you know capabilities and constraints. 
Now, this is the first time we are trying to use this term known as cation exchange capacity, which you might have come across. Uh, this is basically the potential of the material uh, to interact with external agencies. So, as the name suggests, this is cation exchange capacity. How easily I can exchange, you know, my knowledge with everybody. That is what is going to make me a good spokesman. That's right. If I am speaking something and somebody can follow, and what he or she is saying, I can follow. The exchange should be good. Similarly, in case of the soils, most of these particles are negatively charged, and negatively charged particles are going to attract contaminants because contaminants are cations. Okay, and these cations are coming from the different types of industrial effluents. Now, how easily this material can exchange these ions is its capability and that what makes it a hyperactive material or a passive material. So, in case of sands where you have realized surface areas are extremely low, their cation exchange capacities are low, they are passive materials, but look at the monmonite or the type of zeolites which are being produced by synthesis of you know industrial processes, they are hyperactive cation exchange capacity material. I think I cited this also in the class some time back that after this type of breaches which occur where the soil becomes contaminated, what you require is scrubbers and the scrubs are nothing but materials having very high cation exchange capacity. So, if I just you know uh, give a sort of a layer of these scrubs and if I peel it off, what is going to happen? All the contaminants which were in the soil mass should have come out. Imagine if you can create a scrub like this. Good example is you have scrubs on your skin, then you take bath. So, you use a soap or a scrub which will take out all dirts, type of dirts, electrolytes, chemicals, bacteria from the skin and clothes. Why can't this be done for soil mass? The next one is, uh, of course, very complicated biochemical degradation of the geomaterials. This is what our focus is right now, because those of you who might get a chance to work in the field of uh, municipal solid waste sludge digestion, where you have particulate matter, where you have liquid phase matter, gaseous phase matter, everybody is talking about degradation process how we can degrade the whole thing without using chemicals, clear. Yeah. So, this component has got added up to the our subject. So, if you can degrade biosolids very quickly, the sludge which is coming out of the water treatment plant, sewage treatment plant, the municipal solid waste, industrial waste, the waste will disappear. When waste disappears, I am giving more breathing space to the industries to run themselves. Otherwise, the question is if I am working 100 percent efficiency to produce something, where should I dump my waste? Hope you are realizing the cycle is getting complete. So, this is where the question comes whether uh, the soil classification which is prevailing, which is in the textbook, whether it is acceptable or not. If not, how to change it? And that is the turning point in the subject. So, the present scenario is that we consider these parameters primarily all right uh, grain size distribution we rely too much on the physics of the material grain size grain size is nothing but the physical attribute dimension angularity morphology ok. Even shear strength you have talked about if the grains are you know not very smooth the friction angles are going to be very high agreed cohesion is going to be very high because of interlocking effect. The second thing is soil consistency, soil water interaction, but the water which you have taken in the laboratory was purest form of the water correct demineralized water and you have obtained all the properties based on the interaction of the soil with pure water which is not really going to be valid. Another stupid thing which we have done is we have taken the soil and we have put it in the oven to get rid of all microbial activity, we have made it very dormant, clear. What else we did? We treated the soil with chemicals H2O2 
pericloride to do the hydro beta test. So, this is not the soil at all which you really wanted to study, you have altered the state of the material on which you are getting the particle size distribution and other properties. The question is if you start looking at the whole thing in such a microscopic level, where would it end? So, life is not so difficult, let us make it so simple because we are all engineers, we are not going into the micro details so much that we cannot come out of it. So, what should be the proposed scenario? What parameters should be added? is the basic question. So, percentage passing through 200 number sieve is fine, a specific surface area which I am sure you have not really considered too much because specific surface area is a fundamental property of a mineral and the more the specific surface area, the more the activity. So, what differentiates sands and the clays? In sands the specific surface area would be some 20 centimeter square per gram all right and in case of clays it could be 2000 centimeter square per gram more than that also. Pore fluid characteristics we have not considered there. Pore fluid I think I gave you an analogy that uh, analogy that pore fluid is something like the blood in your body that makes everything, the, the type of food which you eat, the type of thoughts which you have, people say the blood gets formed accordingly, correct. So, the type of contamination history through which the soil mass has gone through will get reflected in its pore fluid characteristics. The attributes of the pore fluids could be several, not only pH, cationic species which is present in this, all right, uh, the pH the total dissolved solids, gaseous phase which is present in the pore solution. So, the way you took out the sample of the blood from the human body, now what is happening? People are trying to emulate the same thing for extracting the pore fluid from the soil mass and then understanding how healthy it is. And if it is not healthy, give proper medication that becomes the practice of environmental geomechanics. But before that you have to understand all these pathological examinations, you cannot jump directly to the remediation or the treatment. Ion exchange capacity is same as cation exchange capacity, sorption characteristics. I think I use this term somewhere sorption, you know if a surface is very very active, it is bound to retain the contaminants in the liquid phase, in the gaseous phase of both. Solid to solid interaction is not going to be so important for us and it is not going to give an example of a sorption. So, sorption is if I take a drop of water and if I just drop it over here, what is going to happen? Because of surface tension there will be some you know drop formation, flat, elliptical. But what is happening between the interface between this drop and the surface which is also known as substrate, we will use these terms later on. Substrate, substrate is a surface, how the drop is going to interact with the substrate provided the drop has contamination of all sorts at high temperature, low temperature, high pressure, low, low pressure and so on. Now, I think you are realizing it is a big matrix. Electrical properties, can I use electrical properties of the material like electrical conductivity, dielectric constant to understand it better? Answer is yes, lot of studies have been done, we will be talking about that. Thermal processes, thermal conductivity, thermal diffusivity, heat capacity. So, you must be realizing we are now again going back towards more the basic sciences, why? because we have realized that the type of assumptions which we have made were not really very good and that is the reason most of the systems are not able to withstand the fury of the environmental forces. Sir, I have one question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as a result of uh, interaction between uh, contaminants and saturated soil mass, Suppose the whole water becomes poisonous and the soil mass becomes contaminated, then 
it is possible to bring the soil mass to the initial conditions if it is then how answer is yes how you have to study and you have to charge to the industry free of cost never give a solution to anybody so i will just give you the basic concepts of how to clean it up but i will not give you a correct answer why because i want you to do some basic ground work but yes answer is yes and that's what the profession is you have to go and help your clients so suppose there is a deposit which is contaminated you say yes i will help you take this project be contaminated don't worry you will get some clues from our discussion all right okay thank you sir type on internet um, what is the fate of the contaminated soils in the country and how many sites have been identified by ngt and what should be what is being done for them incidentally all the landfills wherever they are located if you remove the landfills from there what is the fate of these soils they are all contaminated now what you are supposed to do before selling it to somebody for making an industrial setup or some facility you have to remediate it so remediation is a very big subject write down remediation contaminated soil remediation but yes through this discussion i will give you enough ideas how to wash soils the way you wash your clothes and you make them clean all right anything else yeah uh, i particularly don't have any question but i have to add something uh, as you discussed in the earlier slides uh, the interaction between soil and uh, uh, waste and the nature it will possess on the uh, earth uh, uh, many questions were arising in my mind about the uh, change in the nature and what we are we have studied about the soil characteristics and properties so uh, after the that slide of uh, flaws in what we studied earlier i i i have many answers to my question which are arising so uh, it will it it is becoming really interesting uh, that uh, whole uh, whole the that question and that domain every everything we studied earlier can be modified and can be used as of now so uh, that's my feeling about okay. that good thank you yeah, okay so let me take very quickly uh, your questions which you have been asking to my students of course i'm sure that they must have given you the answer but uh, let's reinterpret them what are the reasons for storing the red mud in ponds and disposal areas can it be used for some applications see please remember one thing now the second part of the question should never come in your mind that can it be used for some application why everything has to be used there is nothing which can be disposed of why where are you going to dispose of there is no land fine so henceforth please remove the second part of the question can it be done that flexibility we don't have you have to do it so the first part of the question is what are the reasons for storing the red mud in the ponds and disposal areas if you go to the websites which i have shown you uh, you will realize that whatever red mud red mud is a waste which comes out from the alumina refineries fine earlier practice was they used to make a slurry and they used to dump it now when you are making a slurry slurry disposal will always be in the ponds which are engineered ponds lot of volumes of water is required now water is nowhere how long you will be practicing this so there is a switch over what they do is and it's not only the water there is a lot of sodium hydroxide which is associated with this so what industries are doing is they are squeezing out all the sodium hydroxide from the red mud before its disposal now this is what is known as a filter press process i mean you take out all the liquids back circulate in the industry you are saving money on caustic 
whatever semi solid comes that is stacked in the disposal area. Why? Because pH is very high, you cannot just throw it anywhere. You are violating the rules if you are throwing it anywhere here and there, and MOEFCC, CPCB may take a strict action against you. So, this is the answer to the question, all right. So, what are the reasons for storing the red mud in ponds and disposal areas? These are the two reasons. And can it be used for some application? You have to use it, and uh, now we are thinking big. I do not know how many of you have really visited that industrial byproducts application and the mission where I am thinking of you know something very big where contributions from all of you are really required alone I cannot do anything. The question number 2 is can you provide more comprehensive details about the executed case studies there is something known as professional integrity. Go to lawyers I am sure they never discuss about the case of the person who visited before you correct surgeons. My number will be 16, the patient number 15 is being operated upon. Have you ever seen a surgeon telling that what was the problem with him? He said, you just come inside and let me operate upon you and you forget about others. My job is to save your life, agreed? So, there is something known as confidentiality. It does not mean that uh, we will not teach you in the classrooms. You must have realized that uh, comprehensive details can also be given in a non mathematical form. I need not to show you some numbers to prove that where what has happened. So, it could be descriptive also clear. So, that means the details which you are hearing are from one of the projects which I might have executed somewhere or which I might have read from somewhere. But yes, I have been practicing this subject since last at least I would say 20 years. So, I have come across several case studies. Many of them who are sitting on this side are dealing with the live cases. But please remember they are also bound by the NDAs because otherwise these are all going to be national news headlines. You know this and my answer is very simple, the more you knowledge you distribute you are going to be in trouble, I have no idea who said what to whom. So, you have to maintain uh, a sort of a what do you call it confidentiality. Why? There are several organizations, several people who are against any type of activity which you do in the name of something agreed without knowing the full details. So, we have to be very careful, we have to do our profession in a very silent way, talk only technical things and develop the knowledge. And please understand one thing, we do not require people who are gossipers, we need people who are executioners. And execution is always done in a very silent manner. I am sure surgeons do not publicize anything. Got, got it? I give you examples of lawyers, judges, they do not discuss anything, they just take a decision the way they want by synthesizing the information. So, this is also a similar situation. What are the applications of microbially induced calcite precipitation? I hope you must have realized from my discussion that uh, the practical applications would be uh, if you are doing ultra deep mines which I example which I cited also if you are doing ultra deep mines in the sedimentary deposits coal particularly there one of the applications could be that you can you can use MICP to seal the pores so that water does not come inside. For slope stability also you can utilize this, for excavation cuts you can utilize it, but I am I'm not very sure that the knowledge has gone to that level. Erosion control can be done for the soils, so several things people are trying to do. Alteration of state of the material from frictional material to cohesive material can be done by MICP. So, this might help you in tunneling operations. 
in uh, deposits which are frictional in nature or where you have more coarse grained materials that is possible. What are the dimensions of typical oil wells and how does the drilling of oil wells takes place by ensuring that there is no collapse of wells. See I am not an expert in the oil wells my understanding is approximately from few tens of centimeters it can go up to meters of of about 90 centimeter of the oil well typical oil wells are approximately 10 centimeters to 90 centimeter. But that may vary actually there is no hard and fast as such is it not. Yeah, approximately 10 centimeters to 90 centimeters you might get, but I am not an expert. So, please check it out. How does the drilling of oil wells takes place ensuring that there is no collapse of well? Long, long back I did a project for a company where uh, they wanted to do drilling of oil wells and where fly ash senospheres were used. So, my first student, second student Dr. Kole was the one, I think I was telling you this thing that we collected some senospheres from. Uh, the disposal pond of a thermal power plant and when we started checking their properties we realized that their crushing strength is very high. So, from that point onward this story started and then we created uh, deep cementing slurries check it on net deep cementing slurries for oil industry. And when you are designing deep cementing slurries, normal cementing slurries will not help you because their depths are few tens of kilometers to few less than 10 of kilometer. They should be setting at that depth temperature pressure very quickly. So, this type of recipe was developed by me uh, and by my students where we have used lot of components of the minerals, drilling fluids and we have shown their setting properties and their strength. This project was done, but this will not be in public domain anywhere because I hope you realize oil and gas industry is a money making industry and most of the time these are copyrights. So, they do not distribute their knowledge with others. Is this fine? So, senospheres from the ash can be utilized for supporting the deep oil wells when you excavate them. In uh, slurry trenches you must have come across where the bentonite is used when the trenches are 4 to 5 to 6 meters correct. So, there you can use slurry trenches made up of bentonite or clays minerals for supporting them. The, the most important component here is and why I took this project is temperature, pressure, strength, cementing time and no segregation imagine if you are if you are pumping the slurry from the top of few kilometers up to few kilometers the slurry should not segregate and its rheology should remain maintained clear. So, when I will be talking about heat of hydration subsequently for material characterization there all these concepts become very important and most of these slurries should be sustaining the pressure of the liquid which is there what will be the pressure of the oil and gas at that particular depth imagine. So, the plug formation should take place the strength should be good enough. So, that can resist the pressures of the fluids at that temperature big subject become an expert in this you have a whole followership believe me you should be the best in the material science rheological properties how would you uh, inject these slurries from one point to another points in very high temperature, very high pressure conditions and how strength formation will take place. What type of cement should be used alright. Number 5 before any project starts what steps are taken by the industry and consultants to ensure that the project does not cause any environmental harm. I think we have discussed this enough about environmental impact analysis DPR analysis correct. So, any project which you have in your mind if you want to pursue it in real life. The first thing is you have to make a case of it which is known as detailed project report and that DPR you have to submit to your local environmental agencies from there it escalates it goes to the national level and then they discuss. So, the more and more such type of situations come it shows that the country is progressing you know you have more ideas people want to participate 
in industrial development and all. So, EIA is the answer either you do mathematical modeling or you do some simulation or you do some experimentation and that is where most of the industries come to academia to get the answers to these questions. Suppose if I am installing a landfill over here if I am constructing what will be the impact here? If I am st starting a nuclear establishment at this point what would happen here after so many years? X, Y, Z and T everything is X, Y, Z and T ultimately. So, are incentives provided to ensure that the industry takes proper care of the environment? Yes. So, there is a recent gadget of uh, this green credits which has come through CPCB Ministry of uh, Government of India, correct? So, yes, there are big incentives which uh, government gives for environmental cleanup and so on. Can the solutions of using an acid water and washing the red mud be used to decrease its pH? so as to make it useful. My dear please remember the water is not available for drinking in most of the parts of the country, correct? Second thing which you should always keep in mind, if you are making a slurry of something, you are creating secondary tertiary sources of contaminants. You cannot handle big volumes, it is very, very problematic, challenging, Conveyance become a problem, transportation becomes a problem, dealing with the volumes become a problem, what type of industrial activity you are going to do becomes a problem, time becomes a problem, clear? So, come out of all these things, no water is available even to drink, agreed? Not many lucky guys are there to have water, drinking water. So, can the solutions of using an acid water washing the red mud be used to decrease its pH? So, answer to your question is if you read the papers written by my earlier student Dr. Dhanaraj, we have talked about several techniques of washing of the red mud, which unfortunately are under a question mark, not the paper. The techniques which are written there are under a question mark, which many countries have been adopting. So, read this. Go to the papers of Dr. Dhanaraj, correct? Dhanaraj has written on red mud. Anybody else? check that out. So, several methods have been used, but water, drinking water should be the last one to decrease its pH. Now, what he is trying to work on and what Ganraj himself has tried to do it, uh, we are trying to decrease the pH by carbonation, by CO2 and that is a beautiful idea because otherwise this CO2 would have gone into the environment. I am capturing then that, neutralizing the material and mineralizing it is a win-win situation where the research is right now. This uh, ACT project accelerating carbon technology 3 which we are doing, uh, there we had submitted a proposal on this and uh, government was very eager to work on this, but unfortunately did not get selected for funding because of some other reasons, but answer is all these things which I have told you. Is this fine? The last question of the day is uh, why is that globally countries are banning the import of products from specific countries? I do not know, <laughs> geopolitics, become an expert, why? Not many are there who can defend the countries. We should have geopolitical experts who can champion the geo environmental engineering and who can safeguard the countries. One good example is today we have discussed, no, discharge of water in sea, other country is objecting, why? This fellow says, no, I have no other option, I have to do this. What is going to happen after certain time, after peaceful talks are unsuccessful, what is going to happen? That is it, that is what is happening. Right now what is going on in the world, you know, why? Resources, that is the basic instinct. So, this is what we are discussing.